We've seen so much interest in our special 23% off offer for our e-course, Discover Your Second Act Significance, that we're continuing it throughout February. The three-module video course will equip you to transform your life from, is this all there is, to this is all I've ever wanted. Each session is led by Beyond the Crucible founder Warwick Fairfax, who shares his own hard-won successes in turning trials into triumphs. And he's got some high-powered help from USA Today's gratitude guru to a runner-up on TV's Project Runway, from a recording artist with a Billboard number one album to a couple of best-selling authors. It's an ensemble of men and women living significant second acts who would command a six-figure price tag if any business wanted to fill an auditorium with them to coach their employees. But we've packed their insights and action steps into our course for a sliver of that cost. And if you act before the end of February, you'll get 23% off your enrollment. Just visit secondactsignificance.com and use the code 23 for 23. So don't delay. Enroll today and remember, life's too short to live a life you don't love. Now, here's today's podcast episode. Welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast on which we discuss some of life's most devastating, challenging events and circumstances. We call them crucible experiences, and we talk about them to offer hope and healing that, as painful as they may be, they are not the end of your story. In fact, they can be the beginning of a new chapter of your story filled with purpose and, yes, with joy. And speaking of new chapters, you've joined us in the midst of our special winter series, Burn the Ships. For the next several weeks, we will be talking with guests who have been brave enough to make dramatic pivots, leaving behind safe and familiar lives to do something dramatic, new, life-changing, and significant, facing down and overcoming crucibles along the way. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show. Our host and guide is Warwick Fairfax, founder of Beyond the Crucible, who has himself set a few figurative ships on fire in his pursuit of a vision for a life of significance, which gives him both insights into and compassion for others who've walked a similar path. But Warwick is tied even more than usual to this episode because the ships that we're going to talk about burning are in fact ships that Warwick had uh, first sailed. Um, and um, we'll get to that in a minute, Warwick, but I just wanted to say, hey, it's uh, it's good to be with you again. Absolutely. It should be a fun episode. Yeah. The uh, So, listener, the as we were doing this series and talking to guests who have burned their ships, moved on from, from Act 1 in their life, if you will, to Act 2, have have uh, set sail in, in some boats and then boarded new boats, it occurred to us, because of where we were at in the process of the life cycle of Beyond the Crucible, the very fact that we're calling it Beyond the Crucible sort of led us to this episode. And the ships that we're going to talk about burning are the ships of what you remember as crucible leadership to the ships now sailing, which we're calling Beyond the Crucible, not just this podcast, but the entire company, the entire brand of what Warwick has built. So it's going to be kind of fun to have a, a a dialogue episode in the midst of an episode where we're talking to guests about the ships that they've burned. Because you've, you've, if you haven't burned them, when we'll talk about this later in detail, you've remodeled, you've remodeled your ships quite a bit um, uh, in a very good way since launching Crucible Leadership, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, extensive remodeling is a a good word, which we'll get into. You know, like if. Uh, Anybody that owns a home uh, will know that over time, you actually have to remodel. You replace your roof every 20, 30 years. Maybe you need to replace some flooring, carpeting. Uh, things don't last forever. And, you know, remodeling is part of life for at least many people. Yeah. And in many cases, right, it happens because your family expands. It happens because you've you've uh, perhaps moved and you have to remodel the home that you're in because it no longer 
exactly fits uh, where you at, you know, where you're at in life. And that's sort of what's happened as I get ahead of myself. That's sort of what's <laughs> happened from crucible leadership to beyond the crucible. So stick with us, listener. We're going to get into the details of what we're talking about um, and, and how that came to be. So it's kind of like if you remember Prince, he changed his name and he became the artist formerly known as Prince. We're going to talk today about the brand formerly known as Crucible Leadership and where it's at now as beyond the crucible. But where we're going to start is where we always start when we talk to guests, and that is what's the backstory? But it's not of a person this time. It's of that brand. It's of that brand beyond the crucible. What was the formation that le- that it started as crucible leadership. So, you know, Warwick, what was the, you've talked a lot about your backstory. You've talked a lot about your history. You've talked a lot about those things, but what was the, what was the, the, the impetus for starting what was then called crucible leadership? Yeah, it's a good question, Gary. I mean, just, I know listeners know this, but just to level set us very briefly, um, the reason leadership was my passion was because I grew up in this 150-year-old family media business, started by my great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax in 1841, grew to be a massive $750 million, 4,000-person media company, uh, newspapers, TV, radio stations, magazines, had the uh, Australian equivalent of the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, massive company. Uh, you know, dad died in early 87, fresh from Harvard Business School. Uh, you know, I launched a $2.25 billion takeover later in 87, prepared my whole life to go into family business, uh, undergrad degree at Oxford, worked at Wall Street, Harvard Business School, all to fulfill what I saw as my duty. My parents and I felt the company wasn't being well managed and uh, run along the ideals of the founders. So, Hence, with my naive, idealistic crusader mentality, launched this couple billion dollar takeover. <laughs> and of course, things went wrong from the start. Family members sold out. They didn't believe in me or my vision. Who wants to be controlled in a, be in a company controlled by a 26 year old? Stock market crash in 87, too much debt. Three years later, despite bringing in new management and increasing operating profits, the company went bankrupt. So that's actually one of the briefest uh, versions of my story I've ever told. So where Crucible Leadership came from was obviously for many years, this was a tough thing to get over. You know, I felt like I'd let my family down, parents, employees, uh, even God for some strange way since um, I was a believer and the founder was a believer. And I guess I felt like there was some plan that I botched, which a little simplistic uh, theology on my part. Anyway, 90s were uh, not easy years, um, but come around about 2008, uh, the pastor of my church asked me to give a talk in church about my story. And so I did. And what was amazing is um, weeks, months after, people said, you know, Warwick, your story and the lessons learned, it really helped me. And as I often say, you know, I don't think there were any former media moguls in the congregation. It's one thing to talk about cancer, abuse, physical challenges. They are sadly all too common. There will be people in any given audience that can say, yeah, me too. Thank you. You made me feel heard. You made me feel seen. Thank you. This is not a common story. And so that led me to think about writing my book. I never wanted to write a tell-all saying, oh, woe is me. I was right, they were wrong, because that's lame and boring, and I've just, it's against my values, I just refuse to do that. But if I can write a book anchored by my story that will help people, then, um, then you know, I felt called to do it. It took years to write, years to get it published, and, you know, writing about your worst, most painful days is not easy. After a couple hours, I was done. And so that, and so that was sort of, what happened. And so I wrote this book, Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trial to Lead a Life of Significance. Kind of have it here with my- There it uh, is, right there. All sorts of uh, all sorts of tabs, as you can see. And uh, I like, you know, as I said, Embrace Your Trial to Lead a Life of Significance. There's a tagline at the, at the bottom, which says, at age 26, he launched a $2.25 billion takeover bid that failed. 
what could have broken him, set him on the road towards significance. So it's always been about significance, but I felt called to write a leadership book. And so this book is anchored by my story, but it's got stories of my dad and John Fairfax, my great-great-grandfather, the founder, stories of historical leaders and inspirational and faith leaders. And it's all anchored around key principles of leadership. So you know, you've got um, chapters on authenticity in the Embrace Your Crucible section, and then Finding Your Purpose, uh, chapters about faith and uh, character and values. You've got uh, st- uh, chapters about vision, shared vision, how to get a group of people on the same page, listening more broadly, seeking advice from a few, organizational leadership, how you cultivate an environment where people thrive and are encouraged, and implementation. It was all around um, it was all around uh, leadership. That was the original my original passion was um, how to help leaders at all levels be the best leaders they can be. And often the secrets of great leaders is the lessons they learned in their darkest days, whether it's Abraham Mm -hmm. Lincoln in the Civil War, uh, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Britain in World War II, uh, severe crucibles test a leader, and those who have the potential for greatness, it makes them greater leaders. So it was all about uh, leadership and how crucibles can be catalytic in helping leaders become greater leaders. So that was kind of the original vision of what we do here. And uh, in the context of a series that we're calling Burn the Ships, I want you to do something for me. I want you to hold the book up again. Okay, yep. so that book, right? That book, Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trials to Lead a Life of Significance, is what what led to the launching of the ships for Crucible Leadership. In a very real sense, that book is the bottle of champagne that you use to sort of crack across the the boat to get it going, right? That was the that was the inspiration. That was the the all of the information that came out when crucible leadership was brought into being. But we learned some things, right? You learned some things as we went through the initial days. A lot of things changed from the time that you gave that 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 speech in church to the time that you then decided you're going to write the book to the time that you found a publisher to publish the book. And then the time the creating, I mean, lots of things changed. Talk about those a little bit because what it speaks to is what we talk to on this show a lot. And that is the expansion, the growth of a vision, the progression of a vision. The brand crucible leadership, if you will, grew we uh, you know, write blogs, uh, you and me and sometimes others. Uh, we post on social media regularly. A podcast grew, which has been, I don't know, is it a third year? It feels like it's a while now, isn't it? It's, um, it's like four years. It, it started four years ago. Yeah. Wow. Four years ago. Boy, time flies. It's like flies. that, isn't it? It's like, yeah. that. It's like that. <laughs> exactly. And so, amongst other things, I'm a certified executive coach. So I really enjoy uh, questions and interviewing. And uh, you, Gary, just in a formal life, have had a lot of experience uh, on radio and uh, newspapers. So it just was, uh, and we're, we're complementary. We have different personalities, different gifts, but I'd like to think we're a good combination. So, uh, so then, I would yeah, agree. So, yeah, thank you. So you know, the book begat the blog, social media, and then. Um, a podcast, and now we uh, we have an e-course, um, you know, second act significance. So it was originally a book, and then, well, you know, to promote the book and get it published, you need a brand, you need a following, and then it's like, well, another way to tell good stories is through a podcast. So it the the brand and the vision it definitely expanded from just a book. It expanded into a, a number of different activities that we do. Right. And and as those things have gone on, there's been some consistency. We want to make sure that people understand that even though we have remodeled the ship, 
that was previously known as Crucible Leadership. We've remodeled it, added some decks, um, you know, uh, kind of changed the way that, uh, you know, a, a coat of paint here and there. Even though we've changed the name of Crucible Leadership to Beyond the Crucible, the before we get into what, what those differences are, let's talk about what the similarities are that still remain. And that is, um, you discovered and shared in your book some key principles, though, those key principles about both how to lead others in a professional context and how to lead yourself in your day to day life. Those remain right. That's that's in the hardcore DNA of this brand that you've built, regardless of the name that's attached to it, isn't it? That's a very good point. Um, so authenticity being truly who you are, that's something for leaders or for individuals is important. You know, we talk a lot about uh, young people sometimes feel the pressure and stress to be who their parents, friends, teachers want them to be, maybe go be a doctor, lawyer, what have you, you know. And we talk about just being authentic to who you are. Uh, we talk about uh, living in light of your design. So if you love the arts, uh, for instance, just going to be an actuary in an accounting firm, nothing wrong with that, but why would you do that? You know, even if your parents maybe had some, you know, small uh, accounting firm, for instance, you know, or some insurance right. uh, brokerage, it makes no sense. Uh, so living in light of your beliefs and values, it could be a religion, philosophy, way of thought. You want to be true to who you are. You want to have a vision that's unique to you. I mean, there's uh, a team of fellow travelers to help you implement it. So what applies to an organization or, or a leader of a, a large organization is true for individuals. So those principles such as authenticity, character, beliefs, vision, uh, they haven't gone away. Uh, and we'll talk, but there's been a bit of a shift, which we'll talk about. But the core, some of the core elements in the book uh, are still true. Absolutely. And, and there's still much, there's still much for people who are in leadership positions and organizations to glean from beyond the crucible. But there's also been some addition. It is a, it is not an either or leadership or, or self-development. It's a both and. Both of those things are are robustly discussed, robustly revealed in the way that Beyond the Crucible is now moving forward. All right, so we're talking a lot about a change from uh, being being almost exclusively, at least referring to ourselves as being about leadership, about about talking about leadership, about giving tools for leaders to this, this, this shift to beyond the crucible, which expands that base. But before we move on to that, it would be, I think, really instructive for listeners to know this question. And I don't know that I've ever, anyone's ever asked you this as directly as I'm about to. And that's this, where did Warwick Fairfax's passion for leadership come from? Where did it start? How did it develop? Why is it there? So part of my passion for leadership was almost inherited. It was my duty, in a sense, to uh, lead this large company. And so, um, you know, I guess uh, really where I felt like I was being thrust into the front lines, if you will, was um, my dad was removed as chairman by some other family members in 1976. And then my future role was, um, it was it was imminent. It felt imminent, even though I was 15 at the time. Right. And so, you know, Oxford, Wall Street, Harvard Business School. And even as a teenager, you know, people would ask me, well, what is it you want to do in life? And you know, some people at that point, they might say fireman, policeman, maybe Maybe they say, yep, I'd love to be a concert pianist or I'd love to, I don't know, work in advertising. Maybe it gets a little bit more defined as you start getting into your late teenage years. You have some clue about what you want to do. But I always answered this in a strange way. I said, I want to be a general manager. How many kids say mm. that? Like none. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, right. You know, yippee, I'm going to be an actuary. I'm going to be a general manager. I'm going to, I don't know, uh, whatever it is. But um, the reason is because I felt general managers were people that cared for and encouraged people. 
That's how I viewed it. And so in my mind's eye, and this is going to sound a bit silly, I saw myself even as a teenager one day being a leading position in the company is that then was John Fairfax Limited giving speeches to the employees, not other people, but the employees encouraging them, you know, telling them that they mattered, creating an environment in which they could flourish and succeed and be respected. So leadership to me was about creating an environment where people could be encouraged to be the best they could be within their gifting and flourish and succeed. It was all very altruistic. It wasn't about profits and Right. You know, uh, business visions and goals. It was about none of that. It was about having people be uh, be cared for. And so, um, when you sort of understand that the shift is maybe not as surprising, since I'm all about uh, helping people, maybe individuals be the best they can be, and um, now obviously overcome crucibles, overcome setbacks and failure. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about. You were 15, right? And you wanted to be a general manager. And this is what you thought a general manager did. This is how you envisioned it. Fast forward to the start of Crucible Leadership. That's what your book does, right? That's what you have aimed to do with this business is to encourage people, to care for people. We talk about it all the time, right? Hope and healing. We are dealers in hope. I've heard you say, if I've heard you say it once, I've heard you say it 200 times. That is, so that that life trajectory maybe got, got bumped off course a little bit, but you've stayed on it for sure. That said, um, now that you've said that, and I've sort of set this up, that vision from the outset for for leadership that's morphed the even even the leadership components of crucible leadership that's morphed over time how has that happened in what ways that maybe listeners either have seen and and haven't pulled them all like pulled all the balloon strings together or they haven't seen how has that morphed over time yeah we'll get into more detail here in a moment but at a high level what happened to us and to me is really a good example of how leadership, leadership, <laughs> how, um, I still can't <laughs> help saying the word, but uh, how visions tend to morph, expand, be refined. And that's what happened. You got to listen to your kind of inner voice, uh, to your, the spirit, to God, you know, whatever you, what you, whatever your construct is, and what happened in particular as, as we recorded podcast episodes, some were leaders, some were uh, just individuals, and you know, we weren't just recording uh, stories about leadership crises. Some were very personal, uh, personal tragedies, which you know we'll uh, get into, and. We began using words like "you're not defined by your worst day." That wasn't a phrase that existed in the then crucial right. leadership lexicon before we started recording podcasts. It just, you know, came out of our discussions with guests, and we found that it was getting it was very personal. How do individuals overcome their worst day, setbacks, and failures? It could be their fault, or it could be something terrible that was done to them. How do they find drops of grace, drops of redemption to use that pain for a purpose to um, often out of the ashes of a crucible have a vision that would help others? Now, yes, I suppose you could call it leadership in some ways, but it was really more the focus wasn't on organizations or management or creating shared vision or what have you that's in the book. The focus is on if today's your worst day, how do you get out of the pit and redeem some of the pain that you've been through in a way that helps others, which we call a life of significance? Right. So it basically the the change was already happening without us realizing it. It was happening right. organically, in large part because of our discussions on the Beyond the Crucible podcast. Right, and one of the things I think that really helped. One of the moments that sticks out for me that really expanded that vision was the Second Act Significance series. 
um, the idea that crucibles aren't always these these devastating, you know, big headline. You and I both have newspaper backgrounds. There aren't there aren't always this, you know, eighty seven point type headline of some tragedy that's happened to you. It's a more internal tragedy. It's it's what um, you know we've come to call a quiet crucible. It's that is this all there is moment? I could be doing more. It's your cubicle moment. I'm mm-hmm. uh, you know I'm playing small. There's something else that I can be doing. Um, those things, again, they were not in the original vision, but as we walked out the vision, as you walked out the vision, those things stuck to you like, like uh, let's keep talking about ships, like barnacles to a ship, right? As the ship's going through the waters, they, 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 they clung to you. And we kept talking about them and talking about them. And the time came to formally do what we have been doing informally. And that was add a little bit of, 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 uh, breadth into this vision that you, that you hatched that was working so well. So as I've, you know, it, it is truly not an either or from leadership to, to, um, uh, personal growth. It's a both and. Um, there, absolutely, there's, there, there are things in Beyond the Crucible for leaders of organizations. There's also things in there for people who are trying to lead their families. A phrase I came up with way at the beginning, Warwick, five years ago, that we haven't <laughs> used much, but leaders in, right, from the boardroom to the living room. That turned Absolute. out to be a little prescient in the sense that it's not just about business leadership. It's also about life leadership, leading yourself, um, helping yourself be resilient, moving that way through those kinds of things. So all of this, I should say, I should have said at the beginning and I didn't, but you mentioned blog a few minutes ago and I'm like, oh, all of this is tied to a blog that will soon be, if not already on uh, the Beyond the Crucible website, beyondthecrucible.com will be there shortly, which discusses exactly what we're talking about here why the change in name and what you the listener to this podcast and the reader of those blogs and the engager of the content that we offer what you can get from it so that blog will unpack a lot of what we're talking about here today and just to show that those of us who work at beyond the crucible um, go through crucibles continually um, uh, I'm not looking at my phone because I'm not paying attention. I'm looking at my phone because this is where the blog lives right now because ice storms have knocked out my power at my house and I can't print it out. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the blog here on my, uh, on my phone. But if it, it uh, so that's what I'm doing, folks. I'm not ignoring you. I'm, I'm, I'm reading points of the blog. Uh, the blog um, is all about, as we've been talking, this not burning the ships so much as remodeling the ships. Why did we, we remodel? And there's three points, Warwick, that we wanted to talk about. And the first one is we wanted to make clear that we don't just serve business leaders. Again, it's not that we don't serve business leaders. We do. But it's a both and. It's business leaders and it's personal development. We have, to your very excellent point that you've made as we've been talking, we've expanded the vision. How has that developed and what's exciting to you about that development, about that expansion? Yeah, I mean, it's well said. I mean, yes, we're happy to, in one sense, um, serve you know individual business leaders, but we're less focused on organizational leadership uh, which is important, and there's definitely some of that in my book, Crucible Leadership. But we're really focused on individual leadership, and just through the stories on our podcast, Beyond the Crucible, <clears throat> we really focused on stories of redemption, of forgiveness, mm-hmm. people forgiving themselves, forgiving others, which, of course, as we say, does not mean condoning, Uh learning the lessons of their crucible. And so how do you bounce back from your worst day and lead a, what we call a life of significance, a life on purpose dedicated to serving others? So really, we're not against business leaders and helping them, but we want to make sure that we want to help every individual who's been through a crucible, or as we say in second act, significance is feeling stuck and is going through an is this all there is moment. We want to help them get right. through those setbacks and challenges to have a life that's flourishing and feeling with joy and fulfillment 
which we believe is ultimately uh, what we call a life of significance. Again, a life on purpose, dedicating, serving others. So we wanted to make people re- help people realize it's not just about leaders of large businesses and organizations. We want to help all people get beyond their worst day and live a life of significance. And and the thing that sticks out for me on that on that front um, of a guest who had a physical, she was not a business leader. She had a physical crucible, but the lesson that she shared is something that the the, the head of a Fortune 500 company can apply to his or her. Uh, own crucible experience. And that's Stacey Kopass, who said of her becoming paralyzed when she dove into an, an uh, you know, in-ground pool. And even though she wasn't supposed to when she was young, she did it anyway. Um, she became paralyzed. She came after some serious crucibles, drug addiction, just sort of being listless. She came to, she viewed what happened to her as a gift because all the things that developed in her personal life and how she was able to uh, build some new ships wouldn't have happened without that. I think that lesson, true, that lesson can apply to people going through a divorce, right? This is a gift. This is something I can learn something from this that will make my life better moving forward. That's true both for the individual who's just trying to live life day to day to the business leader who's trying to live, you know, trying to lead 10,000 people in a company, isn't it? Yeah, it's such a good point, Gary. I mean, Stacey Kopass, this you know, uh, Australian woman who said you know dove into a pool and was diagnosed, um, you know, as a uh, quadriplegic. I'm trying to remember back then. Um, yeah, it was a paraplegic, uh, I believe. Yeah, paraplegic. Yeah. Uh, so that was just um, that was just amazing because to say what she went through as a gift, I think what she means is. You know, uh, nobody wants to um, go through something like that, going through that level of crucible. But yet, within that pain, there is a gift, maybe the hardest, most painful gift you've ever received, but it's something that can make you a better person. It really focused her on her priorities, and uh, it made her a different person as a coach, as a consultant, and a number of folks since have have said that and uh it made me i guess grow and expand and refine my own thinking about my own right. life you know we're talking about a vision expanding refining and growing and um i never would have said a few years ago uh maybe not even a year ago oh I, what i went through was a gift but i've now said what i went through was a gift and it was in some sense as i've said deliverance which is a word I didn't use until about a year ago, from almost the bondage of a family business when I was being somebody that I wasn't. I'm now free to be who I am and from my perspective, who God designed me to be. So um, yeah, it was a hard gift, but I love what I do now with Beyond the Crucible and trying to help help people in, in, a, in every way we can. But um, yeah, crucibles, they can be a gift if you allow them to. Right. And that's something that we learned from you know listening to folks so um that's one of the things i love about beyond the crucible is we're continuing to learn and grow not just the brand but our own personal knowledge just right. from listening to people's stories and and what that that means in the context of this series burn the ships we'll call it for this episode you know asterisk uh, remodel the ships um because we didn't burn any um but we're remodeling it right it's it, it's artwork you can use to 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 hang on your walls to remind you of those waypoints that you found out there what stacy copas said that was a that was a painting you hung on the wall of your ship as you kept moving forward because that's a reminder of that truth that applies to business leaders and to individuals uh before we move on to the second point of the blog, is there anything else, Warwick, that you want to add about this? the uh, first point here that we wanted to make clear that we're not just about business leaders, we're about, about personal development as well? Yeah, no, other than to say just by saying crucible leadership, it created a barrier potentially. People might think, well, I'm not really a leader. And we could say, well, actually, everybody that has a vision coming out of their crucible is a leader because it's, as you said, leadership from the boardroom to the living room. Now, we can say all that, but 
you don't really get through the um uh you know the the wall of people's thinking of people's perceptions you say a oh, crucible leadership i'm not a leader so we don't even get to have the conversation because they they stop there and if they don't get in the door you can't really have a conversation so um you know beyond the crucible more help people understand okay this is about getting beyond my worst day got it so the yep. word crucible leadership that from a branding perspective it's more than just branding from a you know, allowing people to receive guidance, assistance, help. The word leadership created a uh, a wall that maybe some people might not go through because right. oh, I'm not a leader. That's not for me. Even though you and I have a different definition of leader than perhaps some might. Some people think oh, leadership just means leading a big organization, you know, big company, big nonprofit. That's not me. Therefore, crucible leadership can't help me. So there was a perceptual barrier that the word leadership, as much as I believe in leadership and good leadership, that perceptual barrier, I think, could have prevented people from coming in. That was a big reason for the, uh, or one of the big reasons for the shift. Right. And the so the second point in the blog is this. We wanted to emphasize our pivot from primarily telling Warwick's story and the stories of other leaders to helping you live out your story, listener. That really is uh, a critical pivot that it's beyond just telling stories. We tell stories, but we also offer true aids to help you as you go forward. Those things have just developed organically as, as to your point, Warwick, from when you were 15, you wanted to help people. You want, you know, that's what general managers do. They, they help people. You've wanted to do that it developed naturally the 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 remodeling of the beyond the crucible ship i mean the uh, crucible leadership ship to the beyond the crucible ship really is about recognizing that there are teachable moments within those stories let's extract those teachable moments and put them in the arsenal of the folks that we're serving right absolutely gary i mean really yeah the book started with my story, the story of my father, John Fairfax, who founded the media company, stories of historical and um, uh, inspirational and faith leaders. And with the podcast, you know, some people are well known, some people are not well known. They're just regular, um, regular individuals like, you know, Stacey Kopass and a number of others. And so, uh, really what is, it's evolved. And, you know, we always had principles in crucible leadership right. of refined design, vision, reality. You're refined by your crucibles. We're designed by God or our, your creator. Have you look at it a certain way? Values and beliefs. Uh, you can find vision within your crucible and then implement it with, you know, fellow travelers, uh, friends, coworkers. So we always had some concepts, but now we're, emphasizing those a lot more so that stories are helpful but because they illustrate points. But from those stories, we try to share uh, as best we can moments of inspiration, teaching, uh, nuggets of wisdom, if you will, uh, to the best degree we can uh, that you know, we have or, or you know, um, glean from others, and then turn those stories and those principles of inspiration into practical tools that ultimately help you right. implement the learning from the stories and the inspirational points. And really, uh, our friends at Signal, led by Cheryl Farr, I couldn't really say it any better than what they have on the new tagline for the website and my new business card and your new business card, which says, beyond the crucible, inspiration and tools to turn your trials into triumphs. I don't know if the camera can quite Focus on it is a kind of tad small. If it doesn't focus, I do apologize. <laughs> but anyway, trust me. Yeah, we can it's, put it in the show notes. There. We'll put it in the show notes. Indeed. If yeah. you go, if you go to the website, I'm sure that'll be all over the place. Uh, so, yeah, stories are important, but it's not just my story um, or stories of leaders and history and faith and inspirational. It's everyday stories that we um, 
talk about all the time on the podcast and uh, using those stories and moments of inspiration, thoughts of inspiration, to weave all those into practical tools to help you get beyond your worst day, to help you lead uh, a life as a significance, have a vision that you're off the charts passionate about. So it's yeah, stories, inspiration, and ultimately practical tools to help you live uh, the life you've always wanted to live. Right. And one of the things that we learned, and it was a huge learning, maybe the the biggest learning that we'll talk about in this conversation, um, was just how many people, I mean, we always had, you always had, we always had the idea in our heads that you weren't alone. There's a reason why the speech that you gave at church resonated with people, even though you said, I don't see a lot of other um, former media moguls in here. Something resonated with them. We, Crucible Leadership, the name at the time, commissioned a study, now that's still going on by Beyond the Crucible, that found just how, how, how big that pool of folks is who have been through a crucible moment. Talk a little bit about that and, and what that has meant for the brand first crucible leadership. And now, especially as we, as we begin to sail forward as beyond the crucible. Yeah. I mean, uh, we commissioned a study uh, from uh, David and Heather at uh, Dark Horse Insights and they are experts at uh, doing statistically valid surveys. And we have received um, input from more than 5,200 respondents that, um, you know, 72% of them have experienced something so traumatic or painful that it fundamentally changed their life. And, you know, we'll talk more about this um, another time, but What's amazing is irrespective of demographic or age group, that number holds true of having gone right. through a crucible. It's not like, well, it's mainly skewed to people over 50 because they've lived a long life and stuff happens. I mean, which it does. Uh, there's more right. opportunity for blessings right. and more opportunities for crucibles the longer you live. But what's amazing is it basically says um, there's over a 70% chance that you, the people that you love, your family, the people that you work through, have gone through a devastating crucible. You may know about it, you may not know about it, but that is part of life. So when we talk about how do you bounce back from your worst day, that just doesn't apply to 1% of the population. You know, it's like, oh, everybody else is living right. in Disney, Disneyland and let's deal with the 1% who have had a challenge. No, um, and you know, that when you define it, in terms of uh, something so traumatic that it fundamentally changed their life. And that doesn't include necessarily the people that we talk about in second act significance, that maybe their life is okay, but it feels like it's black and white and they want technicolor. And it's like, they, they right. want to go from, is this right. all there is to this is all I want, which, you know, phrase that you coined. So <laughs> credit Gary Schneeberger there is a brilliant phrase. Uh, Thank you. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that doesn't even include the second act significant folks necessarily. So what it says is this whole concept of coming back from your worst day or challenges, uh, there's a massive need for that. It's, you know, over 70% of folks have gone through significant challenges. Right. And to your point earlier about maybe the word leadership and crucible leadership was a barrier of some sorts to people beyond the crucible perhaps opens up those doors uh, for so for more of that 72% of the people who've been through that to walk through. The other thing that is, uh, is critical, I think, um, about that data that we commissioned about 72% people uh, of people have been through what we define as a crucible experience is that it now gives us scientifically valid what they call hard evidence, hard data of crucible experiences and their effects on, and how many people go through them. And then on top of that, we've, we've gained through the podcast going on four years that that soft data, the, the so we've got quantitative and qualitative data that speaks to crucible experiences. That Warwick, right? That is a is a is a great big 
um, mixing bowl of ingredients to bake a whole lot of tools and helps and efforts and, and, and offerings to our friends who are listening now and who have yet to discover us. There's a lot of hope and healing to your point, uh, to be mined from that data from the, and that it's hard data and soft data, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, yeah, over 5,000 folks who've, uh, responded to the survey, um, that gives its hard data that is quantitative exactly. And as the, the research folks say, you know, we've had what, like, uh, 150 odd episodes, probably over, I don't know, 100, 120 guests. I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, right. we've got a lot of, um, data in terms of qualitative data of people's stories. And what is remarkable, right. and you know, we're continuing to do research to refine this. What are the lessons here, uh, and how can we design uh, even more tools to help people? What's remarkable um, that you and I have discovered on the podcast <clears throat> is that, irrespective of age, gender, race, nationality, background, profession, experience—I mean number of people in the family, you, you know, any way you, you, you slice it, if you will, the commonality in how people both face the crucibles and how they bounced back is incredibly similar. I mean, it was, uh, it was amazing how I felt like, you know, I and you were able to create personal connections with people that were nothing like us that had different backgrounds. You and I right. obviously have very different backgrounds. Um, I guess they're very different backgrounds, certainly than me. Um, and uh, it's just the commonality of making a choice not to let your worst day define you. Forgiveness, not necessarily condoning, but um, finding those uh, wisdom and uh, you know seeds of a vision that can help people. The sense that as you focus on helping others, there's almost drops of grace and healing. That's the staggering thing. Amidst the diversity of background and challenges, the 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 key lessons of how you bounce back from your worst day is incredibly similar. And that just continues right. to blow me away. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Yeah. And I continue to love this series, Burn the Ships, because I get to come up like every five minutes, a, a new metaphor or a new saying that involves ships comes <laughs> into my head, right? As we continue sailing, right? We've got nothing but open water ahead of us now. As we begin to process that data, you'll hear so much more about it, listener, about guests we have on the show, um, about other things that we may be doing to help you uh, process your own crucible experiences. But that... That data and, and the diversity of that data, hard data and soft data, gives us open sailing to really, over the course of the, and, and I, I don't say this um, to be over the top, in the, in, in the weeks, months, and years to come, we have opportunity now to really hone in on some, some, some new ways to help you navigate what it means to move beyond your crucible, to find your significance. That, to me, is a... Is, is just a, uh, that's the headline for the old newspaper man out of this discussion. The third point of our three point blog on this subject is that uh, for the, the, the change in brand from crucible leadership to be on the crucible, the third point is we wanted to offer you more and deeper on opportunities to interact with us. Um, one of the things I love about the, the name change Warwick is that beyond the crucible, bespeaks some kind of action, right? It's it, it's not just like, I mean, my name, Gary, doesn't have any action. You know, exciting Gary has some action to it if I change my name, right? Beyond the Crucible suggests that if you come alongside us, if you come with us, if we come alongside you, if we partner up, you're going to gain some, some skills that will help you move beyond your crucible it's not it, it's it, it's a label yes but it's a label with some implied action to it that will benefit you that's one of the things i i really love about that the other thing that we want to make sure happens here too right is we want to do more things to interact 
with folks like those who are listening right now. Isn't that a, I mean, that's a big part of what we're hoping to do is to hear more from them and, and, and converse more with them and interact more with them and find out more of what they'd like to hear about. I think you're on mute, Warwick. Yeah, well said. Um, I think the the point that you make is uh, is is so good. Um, Beyond the crucible, it's a much more emotive word. Mm. It conjures up an image. I mean, you know, humans think in word in in word pictures. You know, you read a book, and images form in your mind. You know about you know you you create your own movie in a sense if you're reading a a thriller or a romance novel or what have you. So when you hear the words beyond the crucible, at least to me in your mind's eye, you're thinking of I I'm going to get beyond my worst day, and I'm going to be given tools um, because this day is not going to define me. I'm going to get beyond my crucible. The image is to me you know pretty clear. Crucible leadership, it's a good name, uh, but it doesn't quite have that same um, action oriented uh, emotive uh, sense. It's a, it's a, it's a statement, right. crucible leadership. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you have to kind of read the book or at least the first chapter to get a bit more of a flavor. Beyond the crucible, um, it's clearer about uh, what we're promising, what the emotion that's associated with it. It's its an action orientative, orientated emotive word. So right. it's a good, so that's, yeah. I mean, we love Beyond the Crucible and expand it from the podcast and now the whole organization. And yeah, the second point you make is um, as a certified International Coach Federation Executive Coach, I actually love dialoguing with people. It's funny when, mm-hmm. I give speeches and, you know, we've given a bunch of speeches. I was at Seton Hall, a university in northern New Jersey last fall, and I gave a talk to um, some uh, my year at Harvard Business School. Um, whatever the setting is, my favorite part is when we, um, is when we get questions. Um, and I actually love that, that interaction. And so... Uh, we've done uh, some of that. We did a, a session with uh, folks who've, um, uh, you know, purchased our second accident against e-course. Uh, we did dialogue there. We want to have more uh, dialogues and more opportunity to answer people's questions and, you know, really create a dialogue within the Beyond the Crucible community. So, uh, because it's, you know, why we're all about asking, answering people's questions, but you know, by helping to answer people's questions, we want to um, help people, you know, implement the learning and truly get beyond the crucible, uh, you know, lead lives of significance. And so that dialogue, we hope, uh, will really help um, activate discussions that will help uh, real life change happen. Right. And and that's where you'll see, listener, um, we had one uh, a couple weeks ago, as, as we're speaking now, sort of a live Q&A where uh, Warwick's available to answer your questions. We'll be looking to do more of those um, to have. Um, I mean, one thing I, I want to make sure that we want to make sure you go away from from this episode with is our email address. If you have any questions for Warwick, uh, any questions for any of us on the team, any questions about what direction we're going, something that you heard on a podcast that you didn't quite understand, whatever the question might be, uh, info at beyondthecrucible.com, send that along to us. Um, you know, that's one thing we're talking a lot about burning ships. Don't burn that address, write it down, <laughs> hang on to it so that you can continue to, as you, as you listen to episodes, as you, uh, go through the discover your second act significance course, as questions come to you about how you navigate beyond your worst day, how you move beyond your crucible, Ask us those questions. We want to engage with you on those subjects. And there'll be more opportunities for that to happen. I mean, I know that you, I've seen you at those speeches when people come up and talk to you. I see you light up when that happens. So those Q&As with 
with the 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 family here at at Beyond the Crucible, the, those folks that we help, those folks that 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 listen to us, that watch us, talking to them uh, more will be uh, just you know lifeblood to you, won't it? Absolutely, yeah. I, I love answering people's questions and hearing their heart, and um, yeah, that's uh, absolutely. I love the that interaction. So, just to sort of level set where we've been, um, we've been talking about in the context of our series, Burn the Ships, we've been talking about the new blog that, if not there yet, will soon be at beyondthecrucible.com um, about why it is indeed we're called Beyond the Crucible uh, now, not called Crucible Leadership. And the three points that we've gone over uh, is uh, for why that change was made. The first one is we wanted to make clear we don't just serve business leaders. We still do, but it's a both and. We serve business leaders and we serve people who are leaders as, I'm going to say it again, because this will be the third time I've said it, which is the most time I've ever said it, from the boardroom <laughs> to the living room. People who are leaders uh, of businesses, but also leaders in their own lives. Um, uh, that's one of the reasons that the name change has happened, that the ship, while not burned, the beyond the crucible ship was not burned, it was remodeled, for sure. Uh, we wanted to emphasize and pivot from primarily telling Warwick's story uh, and the stories of other leaders, including those in his own family, to helping you live out your story. That, I said I said it before, I'll say it again, that to me is the biggest, uh, most exciting pivot for me is that we're focusing even more on helping you live out your story and how we can help you do that. And then the third point in that blog is we wanted to offer more and better opportunities for you to interact with us. That's where we've been. Uh, those are the things that led Warwick to make the decision to, in the context of our series, burn the ship of Beyond the Cruise. Well, he didn't really burn it. He simply remodeled it. We've remodeled it. We've added some new decks. We've put some really great new artwork on the walls. Um, uh, it, it moves uh, perhaps better. Its navigational systems to get you where you need to go have been upgraded. Those are the things that we've done to that ship as we continue to move uh, forward. Um, as we get to the, the point here, Warwick, where it's it's almost time to dock, as they say, um, <laughs> what is is kind of a final thought uh, that you or, or two that you have that you'd like to leave folks with? You know, I think for those who have visions, it could be you might think it's big, small. I think any vision is is big if it kind of moves your heart. Um, you know, it's not necessarily how many people that you impact or serve. I think you've just got to trust yourself, trust your inner voice, trust if you believe in a spiritual con uh, you know, uh, construct, your creator, God, have you look at it, but trust that, uh, that inner voice. And as passionate as you are about your vision, visions can grow and be refined and change and evolve. I mean, our vision evolved from crucible leadership to beyond the crucible. It evolved from an element of organizational leadership, which is fine, to focusing on leaders and individuals at all levels, that focused on stories of redemption, of grace and hope, of not letting uh, your worst day define you, of you know finding vision, finding hope out of the ashes of your crucible to lead a life of significance, a life uh, on purpose dedicated to serving others. So, you know, uh, our vision has grown, refined, and expanded, and don't be afraid of that. It's not easy. When I first heard, gosh, we're thinking of changing from crucible to beyond the crucible, I got <laughs> why, and I was like, okay, sure, I don't need to think about it. Let's go. It's like, I kind of like that title. I mean, right. you know, I wrote a book with the title <laughs> right there. It's there in print. Right. I'm not going right. to get like a magic marker and cross out you know, uh, make it uh, beyond the crucible. Everybody send me their books back and I'm going to change the title. <laughs> no. Right. Start going to bookstores and just like going over them. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. No, not happening. But um, so but you've got to be willing to listen to yourself, listen to your team, uh, because visions grow and expand. You're not abandoning things. 
it's more, it is growing and evolving. So yes, there's my story, but I also want to make sure that listeners understand a big part of why we're doing it is not just to let you know, which we want to let you know what we're doing and why, but there's a purpose behind why we're having this discussion in this Burn the Ship series, because you might, maybe you don't need to burn your uh, proverbial um, vision ship, but yes, as Gary said, you might need to do some extensive remodeling, add decks, right. artworks, uh, change the size of the ship. I mean, you know, whatever. So it's, you've got to be willing to do that because if you don't, you there are opportunities that you may not be uh, taking. It's a way of becoming even more true to yourself. We all should be growing evolve, and evolving as human beings. So therefore, the things that we do, including our visions, need to grow, expand, and evolve. Now, normally I would say the captain's landed the plane, but I'm going to say Warwick Fairfax has just dropped anchor. We're, uh, we're <laughs> in our ship. The anchor is, uh, has indeed dropped. Um, as we always do with these um, these these discussion, these dialogue episodes that involve a, a blog that uh, has been written at beyondthecrucible.com, we're going to leave you with uh, some reflection questions. Reflect, to, you know, to reflect on what we've talked about here. Um, uh, first one is ask yourself this question: In what ways have the resources of Beyond the Crucible helped you? Um, really do a little audit of that and see. Um, in what ways they've helped you. And if you're still struggling with some areas, poke around, ask us what other resources we might have that could help you. Second point is, uh, what are you most interested in learning about how to get beyond your crucible? Uh, jot your thoughts down to ask of Warwick or of the team in a future live Q&A um, uh, or via email. And I'll give you our email address at the end of the third point I'm going to make, which is this. If you could ask Warwick only one question about his story and about the offerings of Beyond the Crucible, what would it be? That's interesting. I even want to jump at that one. <laughs> and I get to ask you questions all the time. Um, take the time right now. Seriously, we're, we're wrapping the episode. Take the time right now to send the question to info at beyondthecrucible.com. Formulate that question, shoot it to us, um, and let us uh, it, do what we said we want to do. Let us engage you in discussion and dialogue to help you move beyond your crucible. Um, that, Warwick, I think wraps up our episode. Um, we, uh, again, are in the midst of a series called Burn the Ships. And we encourage you, um, if your ship feels like it's drifting off course, if you've lost your way a little bit, you're, you can't find the exact navigation where you are going to go. There's a couple things you can do. What we've done here, um, what we've talked about here is sometimes you just need to remodel the ship a little bit. Sometimes you need a new deck, you need a new room, you need uh, maybe new personnel, whatever that looks like. Sometimes there's remodeling, but sometimes there is indeed a time to pull out a matchbook, strike a match, and set that ship on fire for the next best ship that you can board. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.